This is Voicemail, the Universal Postal Union's podcast covering the wonderful world of mail. I'm your host, Ian Kerr. In this episode, I'm joined by the Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, Rebecca Greenspan. Joining me on the line is Rebecca Greenspan. She's the Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, also known as UNCTAD. Rebecca, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us on the podcast today. Let's start with a question we ask all of our guests. What's your first memory of the post? Yeah, you know, I, I was thinking about that. First, I really that my first memory is going with my father to the box where we had, we received our mail. You know, we went to the central post office of Costa Rica. And I love to do that with him because he will take all these letters that came from different places, a family that lived, uh, uh, you know, afar. And he will tell me, oh, this is from Aunt Rochelle, or this is from this and that, and they live in Detroit or they live in Europe, you know? And so it was like opening the world to me at that moment. So that, that was, uh, that, that is my first memory. You know, we didn't receive the letters at home. We received the letters in a box in the central post of Costa Rica that was in the center of San Jose of the city. So I will go specially with him to collect the mail. Isn't it wonderful when the mail can connect families and uh, friends who are so far apart? Uh, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, a bit more about UNCTAD then. You've been in your position there as Secretary General for about two and a half years. What can you highlight as your biggest achievement so far and, and what has been your biggest challenge in this role? Well, I think that, the, that our biggest or, or strongest objective, yes, is to for ANTA to be able to help developing countries to navigate the complexities of development, eh, to allow them to participate in a fairer international economy, and, and to strengthen their advocacy for the reforms that have to happen for them to be able to make it for their people, for a better life for everybody, not leaving anyone behind. And the most challenging part, you know, this has been our motto and our motivation uh, since we were born. But uh, during these two years and a half that I have been in UNCTAD, we have had to navigate a pandemic, you know, the, the effects and impact in the developing world of COVID-19. We have, we have had to navigate the war in Ukraine and followed by a cost of living crisis and a food insecurity crisis. After that, now we have to ha- navigate the impact and the pain in, in, in so many of the Middle East conflict, you know, and uh, so this cascading crisis, as we call it, yeah, have really impacted disproportionately the countries that are most vulnerable and the poorest in the world. And so, in, in, you know, helping in mobilizing the awareness of the world of what is happening and mobilizing action it has been our main concern during these years, really to support countries that have lost, you know, let me say, you know, in one one year of of COVID-19, there were countries that lost 10 years of progress in poverty reduction and hunger. So that's how bad it, it was. UNCTAD has a very diverse portfolio, ranging from trade and finance to transport and technology. Which particular areas are you focusing on right now? And which do you consider to be the most important for UNCTAD in the coming years? Well, uh, you know, uh, we rebranded UNCTAD as UN Trade and Development. So 
people will know what we are about. <laughs> when they read our logo, at least they know now that we are about trade and development. Yeah. And trade and development is, is a wide portfolio because it has to, to do not only with trade per se, but also with the, fi- the financial uh, aspect of uh, development, with technology and with investment. So you have trade, technology, investment, and financing. And we are now including much more the issue of climate change and environment as a cross-cutting to these four areas of expertise together with gender. Yes, that is such an important thing for development. So it's a wide portfolio, but I have to say that ANCA has amazing knowledge and expertise and information in all these areas. What we have to do now is to put that information, that data, that evidence, analysis, and and knowledge and expertise to navigate the shifting patterns in in the economy and in the uh, international uh, sphere, the changes that are happening and how we can adapt and help countries adapt as fast as possible to those changes. And you know, part of the problem is that uh, we are in in an era of such rapid change. It's difficult to cope and countries obviously there are countries that, you know, it's more difficult for them to make the changes, the reforms, and to adapt to this very rapid, exponential change uh, that characterize the 21st century. Yes. And the other problem, and so gaps, gaps widen in STEM, in, instead of closing. Yes. And the other problem is that when You are in an era of such rapid change. Not everything changes at the same time, even in the same society. Yes, there are sectors that adapt much more rapidly, that go and run, and there are others that, you know, crawl. (laughs) And, And so the imbalances that rapid change can bring to society are and create new tensions, that we need to deal with. And that is, uh, you know, the challenge that this organization is facing. I think that we are doing well. Now we are not only uh, an organization that does the analysis after things happen. We want to do it and to be in the discussion and in the dialogue when things are happening. (laughs) So I think that 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 we have been able to do and it has been really very well received by the international community. Now, you mentioned earlier that UNCTAD is uh, has taken a step to rebrand as UN Trade and Development. So can you share with us what's the purpose behind the rebranding and how does the rebranding or how is it expected that this rebrand will support UNCTAD's mission? You know, uh, is that is a very good question. Uh, I think that there has always been a misconception in many organizations about communications. Communications is part of your mission statement. Yes, if we do an analysis that nobody uses, <laughs> we will get nowhere. Yes, we are not influence, influencing, we are not impacting. So it's part of our delivery, it's part of our mission to be able to communicate much more effectively to make visible what we do so people can relate to it as another voice, as another perspective, as another way of looking at things. If we don't, you know, make that, you know, that shift to happen, so whatever we do, you know, doesn't matter. (laughs) So I really think about communications not as a marketing device, but as a mission. And I thought that, you know, our logo was, only said ANCTA. So you have to be like an ANCTA staff to know what we are about. <laughs> yes, that's the reason for the rebranding. So now 
you know, we didn't change our, our name. This continues to be untapped, but it says you and trade and development. You don't have to go to an encyclopedia or to a, <laughs> to a PhD thesis to understand what we are about. <laughs> you read the logo and you more or less have an idea of what this organization is for. Now, UNCTAD uh, and the UPU are both celebrating anniversaries this year, 60th anniversary for UNCTAD. And both the UPU and UNCTAD are long-standing partners with the collaboration spanning across multiple areas. So in your opinion, what is the role posts can play in trade facilitation, particularly in developing countries? And how can the UPU and UNCTAD join forces in the achievement of their respective missions? You know, uh, uh, you, you, you are right. We have a wonderful collaboration with UPU. And I, I, I would say that we are one of the voices that think that UPU is so important because, you know, we are about trade and uh, trade facilitation is key. And you cannot do even, you know, you cannot enter to the era of e-commerce without the postal service. And if you want not only to enter to the era, but if you want the development to be a, a more equitable, yeah, to be fairer, to be more inclusive, how will you connect, you know, remote areas with the modern world, for example? And the postal service does that. It allows things to flow. It allows the distribution. It allows the connectivity. And for us, it is essential. So when we go to countries to do the e-commerce assessment or the digital assessment of the country, yes, to take advantage of these wonderful new possibilities that the digital economy brings to all of us. So we talk about postal. <laughs> Many people only talk about the software or, you know, and, you know, if you understand correctly what trade is about and how e-commerce functions, you understand how important to connect it uh, to a stronger, better, more efficient uh, postal service. So, so we are, uh, we are completely convinced and we think that the, uh, to join forces uh, uh, between UNCTAD and UPU is essential to leverage our expertise, but uh, mainly to be able to bring a uh, trade facilitation, reduce transaction costs, promote economic inclusion, uh, and support sustainable development in, 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 in the developing world. Well, let's focus in a little bit more on e-commerce and the digital economy. You've mentioned a couple of the benefits there. So can you share a bit more what you see as some of the main challenges and opportunities relating to what has essentially been a rapid rise of e-commerce and e-commerce volumes in many developing countries, uh, in particular, some of the major socioeconomic security and environmental implications that we need to take into account? Yes, I, uh, you know, here... Uh, we have the two coins of uh, the two sides of the same coin. Yes, I really believe that the digital economy it has tremendous opportunities for the developing world and for small businesses, for small and medium-sized businesses. You know, big businesses will will make it. <laughs> but the, the problem here is the small and medium-sized businesses and digital. And, you know, it was very clear during the pandemic that we had this explosion of the use of digital for many small, you know, commerce that only uh, was able to survive because of, of digitalization when we were in the lockdowns. Yes. So there are huge opportunities here for uh, the developing world, but especially for small and medium-sized uh, uh, and micro uh, businesses that, is, that are the ones that produce most of the jobs in the developing world. So here you have the, the opportunity really to improve the life of millions of people. The problem is 
that for that to happen, for that to be an opportunity and not to widen the gap that already exists in the digital world, you know, we need to support countries. We need capacity building in the government, to, for the government to know how to support businesses. Yes, in the businesses to be able to use digital, not only in the, in the personal sphere, you know, with the social networks <laughs> or as consumers, but to include digital in production, to increase productivity of these small and medium-sized businesses, and to connect them to markets, and to allow them to, you know, really uh, take advantage of the opportunities. And that sounds very clear, <laughs> but it's not easy to do. Yes, you need a strategy. You need to know uh, the communities, the local markets. You need to understand how business and the dynamic of business inside the countries. And you need resources. You need you need to finance the transformation. You need to finance the adoption of technology. Yes. And that is what we are about. Yes. Uh, we see tremendous opportunities, but we see very important risks. Because if you don't support the small and medium sized and enterprises and, and businesses, what will happen is that the concentration of this new economy in very few hands will really, in my opinion, uh, hurt democracy and economic stability. Let's talk about trade inclusion. The UPU is a founding member of UNCTAD's E-Trade for All initiative and has just recently launched its new Trade Post Award for Trade Inclusion during UNCTAD's e-week at the end of last year. So what do the recent changes related to e-commerce mean for commonly disadvantaged groups such as MSMEs, women and remote communities? And what does UNCTAD do to promote trade inclusion to of these groups? And even how can the UPU support this work? Yeah, very, very important. You know, I think that we, we do a lot in training we have training courses that are very good. Uh, we decompose this digital economy uh, in a way, abstraction, <laughs> into very concrete things that you have to do to get to be able to take advantage of the digital economy. And we do that for small businesses. We do that in our program called uh, Empretech where we take small businesses and we help them to scale up, to have a plan, to, uh, to understand what they have to do to be more formal and to enter into this digital economy. And this Emprotect program has been around for many decades with wonderful results and evaluations done. So we know how to do it. The problem is the scale, yes? Uh, how do you get to the millions of small MSMEs that need this support? So we not only do this in the downstream, we also do this in the upstream, in the policy area, yes, to help governments to have the policies that will allow these businesses to really benefit from the new technologies. And one uh, group that we really uh, are working a lot with is women. And so we have this program called uh, E-Trade for Women, where we bring women that have been able to succeed in the E-Trade digital economy. And what I explain to everybody is that one of the main things of this program is that we are not the voice for these women. We give them the platform to have a voice. That is different. <laughs> we don't represent them. We allow them to represent themselves. We give them the international platform, the, the, the space for them to bring their experience, to talk to other women, 
to influence policies. Because once you have the visibility, once you are being given the possibility to be a leader and to be visible as a leader, governments call you. And many of these women have been called by the governments. You know, what? okay, tell me, from your experience, what should we do? How can we really help businesses to be successful? Because the problem is not to open a business. The problem is to be successful. <laughs> you know, if you die very soon, you know, it doesn't help. Yes. So uh, I think that uh, this program is fantastic. And believe me, when you hear these women talk, oh, my God, they are so strong, so powerful. Uh, they know their, their things so well. They have made a big ideas come to concrete results. Uh, and, and you get the hope for the world that you need to continue, you know, fighting for a, for a fairer and better world. And I think that UPU, precisely because if you can make uh, the, the postal services more effective, less costly, uh, going everywhere, you know, uh, being as fast and, and adapted to the new conditions, you know, these businesses will have a real partner in UPU and the postal services in their countries to, you know, to be successful. Talking about uh, women's inclusion and gender equality, on several occasions in your career, including your current appointment at UNCTAD, you've been the first woman, first woman in history to assume the position. So what's your advice for women who aspire to take on leadership roles in traditionally male-dominated sectors, such as trade and the post? Yeah. First of all, I have to say that I am in the, I, I, I have been able to be the first woman here in Antat. And I had to, in my life, you know, I've been the first woman many times. So I have to say two things. First, you know, I got here because other women fought for me before, you know. And I think that we all have to recognize that. It's not only an individual effort. It has been the effort of a movement of many women that have opened, you know, doors, windows, <laughs> walls <laughs> before for us to be here. And so we have to, to do the same for the women that will come after. And my second thing to say is when we stop counting with the fingers of our hands, <laughs> you know, we will be in equality. I say we still are counting. I am the first or the second or the third, you know. When we, we will stop doing that, you know, it's because we achieved equality. So we are still not there. <laughs> if, I am, if I am the first and not, not number 1,000, <laughs> it's because <laughs> we are not there yet. So what, what should I tell women? Well, first of all, this is a journey. Try not to make it alone. <laughs> you know, look for the support, look for the advice, look for other women, you know, network, yes? And don't think that you don't suffer, uh, you know, in isolation. <laughs> there is still a lot of discrimination, yes? And uh, there is a lot of invisible norms, invisible norms that, you know, affect you. Uh, be perseverant. But and, 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 and I understand that it's not only about you, yes? Yeah, discouragement will come from all sides many times. And uh, you have to be very strong to, to hear your own voice, your own, you know, continue your, your, your journey, as I said before. The other thing is don't look for excuses to discrimination should not be an excuse. Yes. <laughs> and they don't think that everything that happens to you is because of, you know, unfairness. You know, you have to look into yourself. You have to get better. You have to thrive. Yes. Yeah. Being a woman or a man, you have to learn from your mistakes. You have to learn from your own experience. Yes. So be open. 
be open to revise, to criticism, to, you know, that is something that we, we all have to do. We don't get it right in the first go. <laughs> you, the, in life, you, you try and you fail one time and you succeed the other. You know, it's a learning, it's a learning uh, path. And so I think that, it, it, you know, it, those two things that have been, at least for me, uh, good instruments to success. This year, the Summit of the Future will take place in New York with the objective of moving towards a multilateral system that is better positioned to positively impact people's lives. What role do you think multilateralism can play to ensure a better global trade system that benefits all? Yeah, you know, I am really a believer in multilateralism. I think that the world is better and will be better if we strength if we are able to strengthen multilateralism because i think that fragmentation and only self interest of a few won't get us to a better world but multilateralism have been weakened yes uh, uh, we we see that that the uh, uh, geopolitics is driving, even driving the economy. <laughs> uh, sometimes we as economists, I am an economist, yes, and we ask ourselves, is, eco- is this an economic reason or is geopolitics driving the decisions in the trade realm, in the financial, in the uh, production? So we need multilateralism because if it's only a power game and not a world based on internationally agreed rules of the game. The small and the vulnerable will not be able to survive or to, to play in, in, that, uh, in that world, you know? If it's the world of the strong <laughs> and powerful, And so the voices of those that we want to represent in the UN, yes, the voice of those that don't sit at the table many times where the decisions are taken. That's why we need the uh, agreed rules. We need their voices to be heard. How are we going to do that without the multilateral system that will give them the voice and the vote? Because in the multilateral system, everybody has a vote. And... uh, I fear a world without a strong multilateral system. And fragmentation or different systems competing at the same time, yes, will also be so complicated, so complex to navigate that it will hurt uh, the the most vulnerable, the the weakest part of this global uh, world. So we need to be more vocal to, st- to make multilateralism stronger. And I think that the summit of the future is a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity because the summit of the future is about the system. It's about the international global system. It's about making that system a fit for purpose. <laughs> And we need that system because, you know, even if we do what we have to do at the national level, if the international system doesn't work or, you know, impacts us in a negative way, we lose what we have achieved. And that's the case of the pandemic that I put before. You know, if in one year of COVID, you lost what the years of hard work, to uh, overcome poverty and hunger. And in one year, because you didn't get the support, you didn't have the resources, you didn't have the vaccines to protect your people. So you lost one decade, five years of progress in one year. 
So that's not a fair world. You, you will, in, in a world of climate change and climate disasters, where those that contributed the less to have uh, the, the climate uh, change problem are the ones that suffer the most, don't have the financial support to rebuild, to adapt, to be more resilient. Yes. And that is something that countries cannot do alone. We need a system to do it. And it takes a village, like we used to say before, yes? So we are stronger together and we can really have a better world uh, for everybody better. Because even if the powerful and the strong can take the decisions, a world that will be unstable, yes? A, a, way, a, a world where people is suffering and so will, uh, you know, make any system unsustainable. A world that won't be able to act together to allow the objective of Paris, you know, of not getting beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade. A world that will suffer, you know, climate disasters, social disasters and suffering won't be a good world for anybody. So we need multilateralism more than ever to create a more resilient, a more equitable, a more sustainable world and economy. So I think that the Summit of the Future is a huge opportunity to do and decide what we need to do for that to happen. UNCTAD will celebrate its 60th anniversary this December. So are there any special activities planned to mark the occasion? Oh, yes. We have been working very hard for it. And uh, we will have on the 12th of June a, a Global Leaders Forum where we will have the presence of the UN Secretary General and several heads of state and government and uh, ministers of trade and foreign relations will be with us. Uh, we will have on the 12th the a high level with the Secretary General and the heads of state. On the second day, we will have five panels with ministers participating and also civil society, private sector, academia, other organizations of the UN. So to discuss the main issues that we are facing in trade with industrial policy, for example, that is back in investment on, on a, the a global value chains and how that is changing in a, a, with the respect to the least developed countries and the difficulties to open the door for these countries to graduate from uh, being the least developed and go to a world with more opportunities. Uh, in a, a technology where we will discuss the digital economy, yes, and what is happening in, in, in that realm. And in financial, how do we navigate the crisis and the cascading crisis and the a shrinking fiscal space for, for the developing countries. So I think that it, 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 the, the second day will be full of ideas and, and discussion. And the third day, we will bring a very bright minds that are shaping development thinking, you know, to discuss and to talk about what is the new economy, what is the new development, <laughs> what are the frontier issues that we need to deal with in a different way, because this is a different economy. So how theory stands, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the changes that we are seeing in front, you know, happening uh, in front of us. So uh, we will focus in innovative approaches to sustainable development, in addressing issues uh, like trade, finance, technology, and investment, especially from the point of view of developing countries. But we will have the, country, the developed countries and the North participating also in the events. So we hope we will be able to hear each other, to think about the solutions for the future based 
on a great history of ANTAT, because these 60 years, ANTAT has been such an important organization and has given so much in thinking and, and uh, um, instruments uh, to understand reality. So we want the next 60 years, we want the ANTAT of the future. We want to think what is new, what else should we do? Uh, what to focus on. And I hope that this 60th anniversary will help us all, you know, building on our legacy and commitment to build for the future generations and to be able to face the global challenges together better. Rebecca Greenspan, Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Thank you very much for joining us on the UPU Voicemail Podcast today. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Voicemail, the official podcast of the Universal Postal Union. Subscribe to the podcast on your favourite podcast platform and you'll get each episode downloaded to the device of your choosing as it's released. My thanks to the team at the UPU for their help putting together this episode. I'm your host, Ian Kerr, and I look forward to your company next time on Voicemail, the podcast of the UPU. Thank you.